and so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, so first, thank you all very much for uh, coming out and thank you to the organizers for having me. I'm really excited about this talk. Uh, it's something a little bit different for a PowerShell community because <laughs> we're not going to write very much PowerShell today. Um, we're going to take a look at writing your first Visual Studio Code extension, which um, is a really deep rabbit hole, and we're only just going to scratch the surface today. Uh, but like I said, it's I, I find stuff like this really interesting, and and kind of branching out and testing your horizons can be uh, testing your limits can be uh, very rewarding. Uh, I was originally scheduled to give this one uh, at uh, the PowerShell and DevOps Global Summit, but that's not happening anymore. So I'm uh, I'm thrilled to be giving it for for all of you. Um, just for some level setting, I'm not usually a fan of bio slides and stuff, but there's something on this one that I like to call out. The uh, PowerShell uh, Discord and Slack uh, is just a community of people who like to talk about PowerShell. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it, but if not, you can join either Discord or Slack. It's bridged uh, between the two. Uh, there's even IRC, but uh, I don't expect uh, too many people are still using it or quite that old. Uh, you can join with the aka.ms links, PS Discord or PS Slack. And uh, I, I just really encourage people to participate there because uh, it's really friendly, it's really welcoming, uh, and you can you can learn a lot, you can help other people, and uh, it's a pretty rewarding place to be. Uh, I'm a senior security uh, service engineer at Microsoft. I spend most of my time writing uh, code that helps deploy um, systems and apps into uh, high secure environments, uh, but that's not really what we're here to do today. I find I start more and more of my presentations with a slide like this, or even just this exact slide, um, because I do truly believe like, if you write code, you're a dev. And uh, you might go, well, I, like I write a little bit of PowerShell, and that's not really, I'm not a dev, like come on, I'm a help desk person or a sysadmin or something like that. And I would counter with like, I didn't say you were a good dev, I didn't say you were a professional dev, I didn't say anything other than just you're doing development work. And so the point I want to get across here is like, just because you write a little bit of code in PowerShell doesn't mean you can't branch out and try new things. We're going to be looking at a lot of TypeScript today, which is like JavaScript related, right? And so uh, that can be uncomfortable for folks who are exploring that for the first time. But I, I want to see less of this mindset in the community where um, they don't feel like they can try things in the development arena. They don't feel like they can try new languages. They don't feel like they're qualified. And like I, I, I don't like that attitude. And so I really suggest trying to embrace this mentality of, yeah, I write code, I'm a dev, like, uh, that might not be your job title, but it's the activity that you're doing. So without beating that to death anymore, I want people to feel empowered and like they can bite some of this off. And uh, even if you don't do well at it to start with, it's going to be fun, you're going to learn something. And uh, you might get some, uh, some awesome product out of it at the end. And so with that, we'll kind of get on more to today's topic of uh, editing for Visual Studio Code, editing extensions. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Visual Studio Code. It's, the, uh, it's a text editor uh, developed by Microsoft and it's open source. It's on GitHub. You can go to like, uh, github.com slash Microsoft slash VS Code, I think is the repo. And so you can see all the code that makes this thing run. Uh, it's cross-platform, so it's available on Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, it's got like full debugging capabilities, uh, source control, integration. There's plenty of extensions. Like you can see um, there, like there's a Python extension right here and a C++ extension. And uh, you get syntax highlighting and things like that through all of these things. Uh, and it's also uh, the de facto code editor for PowerShell. So VS Code plus the PowerShell extension is uh, the I'll call it the standard editing experience now. The the PowerShell ISE is uh, slowly becoming less and less relevant. And I'm curious what this is. Oh, it's just the chat. Okay, I'll take a look at that when we have some time. Uh, but the thing that's most exciting about VS Code is that it's super extensible. Uh, you can write 
an extension for like whatever you want to do. Uh, this is a screenshot of the Visual Studio Code Marketplace where there's like an entire world of extensions out here. You can see like there's a Docker extension written by Microsoft. Uh, this Angular one, John Papa is a person who works at Microsoft. Here's another Microsoft one. But in and among that, there's all these other ones from like this so uh, side street software and this person's username. Like these are all uh, like non Microsoft people and just folks in the community with an interest who saw a gap or an opportunity and decided to write an extension and share it with the public. So whatever you want to write an extension for, uh, there's, uh, there's a way that you can get involved and there's a, uh, a way that you can share it. I even wrote like what's honestly a really silly extension. Uh, most of the stuff that I write for VS code is not um, made public, but this one is, and uh, it fills a critical gap. Like, have you ever had trouble deciding what to name a variable? It'll generate a random name for whatever artifact you want it to in VS code. Like, isn't that super handy? Here's um, a GIF of it in action. It's picking just random words from an English dictionary. And uh, depending on what um, casing method you want, it puts them in uh, the correct case and stuff like that, camel case or Pascal case. Uh, it's even got like a Star Trek dictionary and a Star Wars dictionary. I think there's a Lord of the Rings dictionary in there. So you can get words exclusively from those universes. There's keyboard shortcuts. And so like this is genuinely not useful, right? Like this is not something that provides a ton of value, but it was a learning experience for me. And uh, it was re really rewarding to be able to get to produce something like this. Uh, and it actually took a lot of learning and doing and, and figuring out. Like this is the product of uh, more than you'd think hours of work. And going like, okay, sweet. But can I actually like do something productive with this? Like what, what are my other options here? Like I, I talked very vaguely about how you can do anything. Uh, but like what does that actually mean? Like uh, you can create a theme, which, okay, we're still kind of in the cute, realm here like not necessarily the most productive thing but people take their themes pretty seriously and for people with um like a visual disability like people uh, people who are colorblind um or um, have some other impairment related to their vision uh themes can be really important and so they're uh, they're a critical part of the of the development ecosystem uh, something more functional like extending the workbench uh, we'll explain a little bit more about that but just adding components and customizing the view and adding functionality to VS code uh, is something that's relatively relatable and this is sort of where we're going to uh, focus uh, on the demo here uh, web views are uh, basically building in uh, like a web page into where you would normally see like the editor uh, in VS Code, and that's useful when you're doing web development. It's useful maybe if you're integrating with a line of business application uh, or something like that, and you need to um, have that experience connected to VS Code. Uh, language extensions, uh, so like I showed you, the, there's the Python extension, the PowerShell extension is really important to a PowerShell user group. Um, if there's a new language that doesn't have an extension represented in the gallery, you can add that. Uh, or if you want to like contribute to the PowerShell extension, then this is information that you're going to need to be able to do that. Uh, and the debugger extensions, I won't talk about too much, but uh, the debugging experience is relatively robust in VS Code, and you can add extensions that modify and, and augment that experience. So you can do better than just sticking random words into your editor. Uh, you're going to have a couple of new uh, best friends when you start writing VS Code extensions, and I bet you're not, they're not the friends you think they're going to be. The first is the contribution points reference guide. Uh, and there's the, uh, the link for it there. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that, but code.visualstudio.com slash API slash references. Uh, and then this last part, contribution points, okay, great. But that first part of the URL is where all of the documentation for VS Code lives and is really, really good. In particular, this contribution points reference guide is good because uh, this walks you through um, 
manipulating the manifest for your extension and uh, describing what it is your extension actually contributes to VS Code. We'll look at it in a little bit more detail um, as we go into the demo here. And then additionally, on like the exact same site, like on, it's still on like code.visualstudio.com slash API slash references. It's just the VS Code API subpart here. Um, this is a description of all of the different ways that your extension can interact with Visual Studio Code. So there's a lot of them and there's a lot of documentation. I'll show you a little bit about how um, you can look through it and kind of discover things here uh, in our demo. But these um, reference guides and all of the documentation on the code.visualstudio.com uh, reference site is terrific and it's critical information when you're embarking down a path of creating your extension. And by the way, there's even a writing your first extension guide. And so we're going to take you a little bit further than this guide does, but it will help you. Like if this goes by quickly, which it does, like this is, um, honestly, it's probably like an hour and 15 minute presentation that we're going to try to squeeze into like 45 or 50 minutes here. So this goes quick. If you need it slower, or if you're just more of, I read an article way of learning, then uh, you can check out the, um, uh, this guide on writing your first extension as well. So prerequisites, right? Like this is development. We, what do we need to do to set up our development environment? Uh, I suggest installing Chocolaty, uh, not because it's needed, but because it makes the setting up the rest of your prerequisites and keeping them up to date really easy. Uh, if you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code uh, template, and then it literally just walks you through a wizard that's going to ask you a bunch of questions about what it is you're trying to do and, uh, and help get you set up out of the box there. Then probably a good idea to like write some code, which is a little bit tongue in cheek here, obviously like build your extension. Okay, great. Thanks for all the help. Uh, we'll show you a little bit about that as soon as we hop into our demo and then read a lot of docs. Right, like I referred to this uh, contribution points in the API reference guide. Uh, you're going to be going back and forth between code, writing your stuff, and the docs to tell you how to write your stuff. Back and forth between these two a lot. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to learn about how the thing works and then to experiment with writing it. Um, the IntelliSense that you get in Visual Studio Code when you're writing for an extension is really good as well. Um, it's very descriptive and, and complete, um, but there's no replacement for just the actual reference guide. So when you're done, you build it, npm run compile, or uh, you, if you're debugging in Visual Studio Code, you can just hit F5. Uh, and then package your extension. And we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll touch base on both of these things here once, uh, once we're ready. Uh, but what this will do is actually like compile your extension. Um, in, we're not used to doing that in PowerShell, um, but we have to actually build it and then create our deployable artifact. So let's actually like make an extension. Let's, oh, the cat knocked down my yarn. Um, we are going to make another really valuable extension uh, that we can do in hopefully a half hour here. Uh, it's going to be a cat fax extension because it's very on brand for me to do something cat related. It's going to reach out to that and retrieve a cat fact. And then it's going to insert that cat fact where the cursor is in the editor. Uh, and so again, not enormously useful, but it's going to be a bit of an introduction into uh, working with the documentation and it's going to be something that we can actually accomplish in a relatively short period of time. In reality, uh, doing this for the first time and trying to figure it out, like I've rehearsed this, right? Like let's not uh, beat around the bush. This is not my first time writing this exact extension. I have prepared for this. Um, when you're doing like the very first time I did it, I had to look stuff up. I found some problems in the way I thought I was doing it. Uh, it was an iterative experience and it took me longer than it's about to take me right now. Knock on wood. Um, and so this isn't to try to make it look easy or diminish it or to make it go by too quickly that you're able to really uh, gather good intel from it. Uh, but it's to show you sort of in a demonstrated way 
read the docs, write the code, read the docs, write the code, and you'll kind of get a feel for uh, what it is we're trying to accomplish here. So first things first, BridgeConf. That was totally a change of gear you weren't expecting. Um, but as mentioned in our intro here, uh, on April 30th, uh, we are doing a virtual conference on twitch.tv slash BridgeConf. You can go there now and uh, follow the channel. Uh, mine says unfollow because I'm already following. Uh, and there's some information about it here about BridgeConf, uh, which I'm sure is too small for you to read. Um, and then links to the Slack and Discord as well. Uh, we have got uh, 11 sessions that we're about to do. Uh, we're really close to being able to release schedule for it, which I'm super excited about. We're waiting for one presenter whose name may or may not rhyme with Justin, who may or may not be presenting after me to confirm that he's free to um, perform the session he, uh, he proposed. And then we're gonna be able to release the schedule for all of you guys. And we're, we're super excited about it. So come check that out. Uh, let's pop on to, oh, thank goodness it blocked. There we go. All right. So uh, let's start building our extension. Right, like, uh, if you remember a whole like three slides ago, I said all you gotta do is go yo code. I've already got my um, prerequisites installed, so I'm not gonna show you how all that goes. Uh, we're just gonna start doing uh, the actual development experience here. And so I typed yo code, and this kind of duplicated artifact here is uh, just because I was messing with my prompt beforehand. Uh, and it says, "Welcome to the Visual Studio Code Extension Generator. What do you actually want to do?" Do you want to write a new extension in TypeScript? Do you want to do it in JavaScript? I'm using the arrow keys to navigate up and down. Um, do you want to make a new color theme, new language support, code snippets? Like this, this goes on for a little while here. Um, and, but what we want to do is develop a new extension. The choice between TypeScript and JavaScript, I won't break down too much, but uh, TypeScript is uh, a superset of JavaScript which allows for typing, which is handy. And if you've done uh, other programming languages, or if you've, especially if one of those languages is JavaScript, uh, I really prefer TypeScript. So hit enter. It's gonna tell me, uh, or ask me rather, what is the name of your extension? So I'm gonna go cat facts. It's gonna ask me, what's the identifier for my extension, which um, has a really detailed explanation, but it's basically a lowercase none spaced version of the name. Uh, what's the description? Inserts a cat fact. Uh, and then do you want to enable TypeScript uh, blah, blah, blah? Uh, I don't know. The default is yes. So I'm just going to go with that. Uh, do I want to enable linting? Sure. Uh, do I want to, like, these are just, like, it, once you get more into TypeScript, you can make a more educated choice uh, about those last two. Um, but for now, let's like, hey, they're default for a reason, right? They must be good. So let's just use those and keep going. Do I want to initialize a Git repository? I'm going to say sure, uh, because like this is something that I intend to share with the world. Uh, it should, its source code should live somewhere and be maintained. Uh, which package manager do you want to install? Use arrow keys. Uh, do I want to use npm or yarn? I like npm. And now look, it does this, all this stuff. It creates these files. It runs npm install. Uh, it does a whole bunch of checking on my things to look for vulnerabilities and, oh, here's how I can fix the one that it found. Uh, and then, hey, okay, cool. To start editing with Visual Studio Code, use the following commands. Change into the catfax directory and then open that directory with code. And then open this quick, uh, quick start.md inside my new extension for further directions. Wow, this looks like it's gonna be really easy. I've now got this catfax directory here, which I didn't have before, so I'll do exactly what it told me. Change into the catfax directory, and I use dash r to reuse the catfax window that I've already got open, or the catfax window, the Visual Studio Code window that I already have open. And I can see, and I can increase the size here. I've got a whole bunch of files already here. 
And if I've even got this uh, quick start guide that uh, was mentioned in the uh, console output. So it tells me, hey, what's in the folder? There's this package.json, which is right here. We're going to look at that in a minute. That's the manifest of the file where you declare your extension and command. And then it's got a bunch of great information there that we're going to cover as we actually talk about it. And then like, hey, oh, there's this source uh, folder that has this extension.ts. This is the main file where you're going to provide the implementation for your command. So like what actually is going to happen when I run my command. Uh, and then some very interesting information. Also, get up and running right away. That sounds good to me. Press F5 to open a new window with your extension loaded. Um, and then tells you uh, Control Shift P and then type Hello World. And so let's see what this extension does. I'm just gonna hit F5, just like the markdown told me. And the first time you uh, run this stuff, you can see it's building. It's gonna take a little bit longer than average. Um, We'll ignore that. I'm sure everything's fine. And then it can be a little bit difficult to see what's happened. Um, but you can see I'm moving around another Visual Studio Code window that opened. Uh, and its title says Extension Development Host. This is different than the window that I was just working in. It popped this open with my uh, custom extension for me to try to experiment with it without actually screwing with the instance of Visual Studio Code that is uh, the one that I'm editing my code in. Uh, if I minimize this, like this is what we were just working with. I've got my debug console there with debug messages, and then I've got my extension development host. What did it tell me to do? It told me Control Shift P, open up the uh, command palette, and then start typing hello world, Hit enter on cool. I got a little message box that said hello world. And in my uh, debug console, I got a message that said your extension is now active. Cool, eh? And so, somebody might need to mute themselves. Uh, I can close that up because that's about all it does right now. Stop debugging, get rid of my uh, pain there. And for our purposes right now, we're done with that file. Uh, what we're going to do next is sort of what the file suggested and take a look at package.json. Uh, and so again, this is the manifest and describes my extension. Uh, it tells me the name, the display name, like you might remember I put this stuff in when we were uh, going through the Yeoman um, scaffolding generator. There's this activation events um, area that uh, describes when my extension is actually activated. I can go into, uh, like I'm at the code.visualstudio.com slash API slash references here. I got the API reference. I got the contribution points reference. There's an activation events reference that I can make a little bigger. And this describes like, uh, when will your extension actually be active? Here's a list of all of the different ways you can activate your extension. Because when Visual Studio Code loads, it, like you can have it just load on star. Like if you click this and read, startup activation event is emitted and interested extensions will be activated whenever the thing starts up, whenever VS Code starts up. And then you go, wow, like, why don't I just do that? Like, I don't want my extension to be loaded and ready to go as soon as VS Code launches. Uh, well, the answer is no, uh, because to ensure a good user experience, only activate your extension when it's necessary. Otherwise, things get bogged down and it's not that great an experience for the end user, uh, which is why they have all these other uh, times and places you can activate your extension. For instance, the PowerShell extension is only active when the language is PowerShell. If you're writing JavaScript, why would the PowerShell extension be activated? Um, on command, well, I can activate my extension when the command that my extension creates is run, which is what we have now. We activate this extension on the command extension.hello world, which is the We'll get to exactly why this is that value in right now. Uh, main, this is just the script that it runs. 
Uh, you don't have to touch that. This contribute section is important though. Uh, Cause this is saying, this is literally what your extension contributes to VS code. And so we can go back to our contribution points reference. And it like, these are, this is a list of all the different things that your extension could contribute to VS code. It could contribute commands, which is what it contributes right now and what it'll continue to contribute, like the control shift P and then it does something. It can contribute key bindings, add a new language, it could contribute a theme or any of these other things. Um, there's a lot of stuff you could contribute. Uh, and so if, I, okay, I'm gonna contribute a command. Uh, and it tells you like what this actually means. Uh, you contribute the UI for a command consisting of a title, icon, blah, blah, blah. By default, commands show in the command palette, uh, but they can also show in other menus. Awesome for them. It shows you an example. Oh, here's the command, here's the title and category. Oh, we didn't put a category in there. That's not there by default. Uh, icon, et cetera. Uh, when a command is invoked from a key binding, you, here's how you refer to it. Uh, and then the commands extension guide to learn more about using command. Like this is very complete, right? Uh, and so what I'm seeing here is a, I'm con this uh, default extension contributes a command. It contributes the extension dot hello world command. And then the title, uh, this was just what appeared in the, in this, in the uh, command palette. It just showed up as hello world. And the intelligence on this is great. Like if I add a, this is just JSON, I can add a comma and then start typing. Oh, I could put a category here. I could put enablement or an icon. How about I put a category and I put uh, cat facts because that's my category. If I save that and press F5 again, I just want to see what's different now. Uh, so here's my development host control shift P and if I start typing hello world Now it's got a little cat fax and a colon next to it because this is the category if you did something like get uh, uh, Here like all the categories for this one are Explorer and stuff like that and so that's where that comes from That's how that gets put in there interesting, right? Uh, also in the package.json is uh, areas that you don't tend to have to touch too much if you're just uh, doing basic um, extension development. Scripts, here's how it builds, here's uh, dev dependencies. These are all the packages that it depends on. And once you get more into TypeScript and developing for Node, um, you can play or screw with this as you deem appropriate. But for now, it's just kind of the first part that we're interested in here. And that's all we really need to talk about in package.json. The other important file that that markdown file I deleted talked about was extension.ts in the source directory. I'm gonna make myself a little bit more room here. Uh, and this is a very well documented TypeScript file. .ts, ts stands for TypeScript. And it tells you, like, I, I won't read every comment here, the module VS Code contains the VS Code extensibility API, import it and reference it, and they've done that. Import as VS Code from VS Code, and like, whoa, we need to put semicolons on the end of our lines? Uh, that's crazy, what am I even looking at? I'm used to PowerShell, not TypeScript. Well, it's okay, because the concepts that you know from writing PowerShell, largely apply here. Uh, we've imported a module so that we can use the commands that are available in it. Okay, we do that in PowerShell. It looks a little different in TypeScript, but you could have just looked up that syntax. Like, you're good, we're, we're not too overwhelmed yet. Uh, here's a method that's, method is just a function, method function, same word. Uh, and it, here's a function called activate. It's even telling me this method is called when your extension is activated, okay. Good to know. Uh, it looks like it takes a parameter right here called context, all right. Uh, and then does this console.log, hey, this message, your extension is now active, looks familiar. That was what was written in the debug pane when the extension first loaded. All right, we know, ex we're starting to tie this together. Uh, it's our first time looking at it and it's going by fast, but that's okay. Uh, here's the command that's been defined. Okay, now here we go. Actually, I'm gonna 
make that go away so we can see better here. Um, this disposable is used here and if I highlight it, I can see that it's pushed to the context. That's some weird voodoo that we're not really talking about. But what I can see here is VS Code, okay, referring to VS Code dot commands. Whoa, all my stuff just popped in and it's telling me uh, exactly what's happening here just because I put my mouse over it. It's the namespace for dealing with commands. In short, a function is the unique handler, blah, blah, blah. We'll read this and I'm registering a command. Look, I've even got like all my parameters and everything listed here. IntelliSense here, very helpful. Here's the command I'm registering. This is, the, this is where I define the name of the command. If I go back to my package.json, and I say, here's my activation event. Here's the extension. Here's the name. Here's the command. This is where I define that name. I'm saying, here's the command I want to register. And then here's what it does. The code you place here will be executed every time your command is executed. Uh, and so I realized that the great comments are probably a little hard to see. But VS Code.Window.Show information message, hello window. Uh, so remember what that did that popped up the little window. So let's try going in here and changing this to whoops. Very sophisticated edit, very topical. And then if I run my extension again and just hit F5, let's see what's changed this time. Um, <clears throat> I can see it's debugging in the original screen. It's orange there, control shift P, my cat fax extension, hello world command. It's activating the extension. And I get my new content. Good, done, ship it. There's your first extension. No, I'm just kidding. Let's do something a little bit more. Uh, let's go get our cat fact now, shall we? Uh, or really what we should do is rename this command. Let's go. Catfax. So I'm just saying I'm registering a command named catfax, not a command named hello world, which means that I need to go back to my package.json and say the command I actually want to activate on is called catfax. Did I make it plural or not? I can't even remember. That's great. Catfax, yes. And the command that I'm contributing is not called hello world, it's called catfax. And so now I've change the name of that command. And I'm just gonna trust that that works so we don't have to build it again. So we gotta tackle a very important concept here, which is retrieving our cat fact. Uh, there's a pretty handy API. Oops. Cat fact .ninja slash fact, and it returns uh, actually a more complicated object than you would assume it would. It returns the fact the cat fanciers association recognizes 44 breeds of cat. Awesome. And it returns the length of that fact. So if I want just the fact, I need to isolate the fact property. And then I just get a string that gives me that fact. IRM invoke rest method. I'm just hitting this rest API, getting that fact. This is a PowerShell console. So <laughs> we did write a little PowerShell today. Everyone's very comfortable with that. Cat's field of vision is about 200 degrees. Awesome. So you can kind of see how this works. Um, you, you hit this API, it returns a fact. Uh, it returns a relatively random fact. It's got a bunch. Uh, and one of the problems is sometimes this API is a little bit slow. Sometimes uh, it encounters an error and doesn't give you a fact back. Uh, and so we would normally be coding around those problems, but we don't have that much time left. So uh, we're just going <laughs> to go with it. Um, there's, there's no real hard time limit. I mean, okay. we won't be evicted out of the building. It's virtual. So as long as Justin is fine with it, we can <laughs> just keep going. No problem. And um, it, it works mostly. Like it hasn't aired out since we've been using it here. So I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, who needs error handling? That's for people who don't trust their APIs, which you shouldn't. Uh, so I've copied that URL. Uh, and I need to do one other thing. Uh, and this isn't something that I'll dive too deeply into. But I want to make an HTTP request to this um, API from TypeScript um, and in my Node application here. So you can do that natively, but it's a lot of code. 
And so when you're doing JavaScript development, one of the things you're going to have to just accept is you don't write very much of your own code. You use other people's libraries. There are millions and millions of libraries and modules. And so you, rather than reinvent the wheel, you can just use somebody else's wheel. So I'll go npm install Axios and save that uh, to my dev environment. Axios is a handy module that I am going to use to make those HTTP calls a little more convenient and um, work uh, a little nicer and allow me to write some nicer code around them here. So I'm going to go uh, up here. I need to actually import that module into my uh, extension. I'm going to do it a little bit differently uh, just because of how Axios works. And again, this isn't a session on Axios uh, and reaching out to an uh, HTTP endpoint isn't likely something that you're going to do. And if it is, then you'll do some more reading on that. The Axios documentation tells me what I need to do to get that code in here and working. I go const Axios equals require Axios. And now I can use this Axios thing in my um, script, similar to how I use this VS Code uh, element in my script. This is just another way of importing the module and referring to it in my code. Uh, like down here, we go like VS Code commands because I'm accessing this from the VS Code module. Later, I can go Axios dot and access the stuff, the methods and properties from the Axios module. I'm also going to make a variable for that URI that we're going to hit. And I'm just going to call it URI very creatively. And now I'm going to write some code here. We're going to comment this line out. Uh, and if you recall down here, this is where uh, what actually happens when my uh, command is executed. This code, the code you place here will be executed every time your command is executed side of what uh, register the command, here's the command name, and then here's what the command does. So I'm gonna enter a couple carriage returns. And again, I'm doing this from memory, uh, but I learned it by reading the documentation for the Axios uh, module, axios.get. And then what do I wanna get? I wanna get my URI. And then this is an asynchronous call. Uh, so I use, it's got a method for dot then, like what does it do after it get, get the URI? And then uh, it takes a property for like where it's gonna put the output. So I'm gonna put out fact uh, and TypeScript wants me to give it a type of any. Oops, curly braces. So what I've done here, uh, just so you kind of understand the syntax, like again, you would uh, read the documentation to learn that this is the correct syntax. But explaining it, I'm getting the URI, I'm doing an HTTP get on this URI, and then when that get is done, uh, put the output from that get into this out fact variable that I've just declared. And with that out fact variable, execute what I'm about to put in these curly braces. Again, explained very clearly in the Axios documentation, not super relevant for VS Code extension development. And so what do I want to do with it? Uh, I'm going to, uh, first let's just write it to the console. I'll go console.log fact, and then uh, this is just string concatenation, uh, fact plus, and then out fact. And I know from the documentation that when this comes back, it has a data. Um, property uh, that I want to access to get the actual data that was returned because like, it also has like status code and things like that. And then I know from playing with it in PowerShell that the data that gets returned has a fact property as well. It had fact, it had length, but I just want the fact. So I'm going to isolate that as well. Put a semicolon there. And now, let's open my debug pane again. If I run this, hitting F5, we will run our cat fact, hello world. We'll probably have to change that very soon. It activates my extension. 
And where last time it popped open that little information box to tell me um, that it uh, just hello world, it greeted me. Now, the first time it does this, it's got to import that Axios thing. And now it activated my cat fax extension. And now I get my fact. Oh, in ancient Egypt, when a family cat died, all family members would shave their eyebrows as a sign of more. Okay, that's totally normal. Um, I've got my fact. I reached out to that endpoint, got my fact, and I stuck it in the console, which is not where I told you we were going to put the fact, but incremental progress here. We reached out to the internet, grabbed a fact, and, uh, and that's really great. Now, we want to actually put it in the editor, like where I've just gestured with my mouse and where I'm typing now. I want to stick my fact there instead of the console. So we'll comment that out. And now we need to figure out how in the world do we do that? And the answer is by reading the documentation. We go to the VS Code API documentation. Again, code.visualstudio.com slash API slash references. Best friend, bookmark it. I've got it bookmarked like three times for like the API reference, the contribution points reference, the activation re events reference. <laughs> like, great. They, you can get them all from the same page. I've got them all bookmarked individually because they're that handy. Um, but here we are on the API reference and it tells you it's a set of APIs that you invoke in your VS Code extension, lists all the VS Code APIs available to extension authors. And so it describes everything that's in here in this VS Code module. And so where we've gone and done VS Code.commands.register command, all of this is documented in here. And so it's got commands. Oh, VS Code.commands. This is the namespace for dealing with commands. All right. I would have probably guessed that, but good to spell it out for me. Uh, the function is also called a command handler. Here's what it does. And you can see in this article, we start scrolling through and it tells me here's the register command. Here's how it interacts with contributes. Here's all the different functions that are in, or that are in the commands space. We use this register command function and it tells me um, what it does, it describes all of the parameters, uh, and this is what you would read to more better understand what's happening here. It's going to tell you what register command does, it's going to tell you what all these parameters are for, and uh, it allows you to kind of understand better, like, oh, here's the command, the string, a unique identifier for the command. Uh, callback, a command handler function, like what's actually going to happen when you run that command. That's what's being described there. Uh, in this article, like commands, comments, debug, like, okay, let's not lose sight of what we were trying to do. We were trying to insert something into the text editor. So is it a command? Maybe, uh, but command seemed like it was more about the command palette and it was more about actually creating the command, not necessarily about interacting with the editor itself. Is it a comment debug? Okay. Environment, maybe ENV probably stands for environment. Like we can look through this and all I did was scroll me down to that section. You can see as I scroll up, this is the tail end of debug. I can go in environment. It's got properties for the app name, app root clip. Oh, I can access the clipboard from my environment. Uh, functions is this again I'm going over it very quickly you would spend more time reading this environments probably not the next one that we want to look at uh, extensions uh, we're writing an extension that we want to edit our thing here in namespace we're dealing with installed extensions again not what we want to do remember we want to interact with the actual editor itself languages source control management tasks window uh, spoiler alert, this is the one we want. Uh, window is the namespace for dealing with the current window of the editor. So this is where a lot of the extensions that might come to mind as things you want to write are going to interact with and live. And there's a whole mess of stuff you can do with this. All the visible and active editors, as well as UI elements to show messages and selections. As you'll remember, uh, this line that I commented out, VS Code.Window. This is the window namespace dot show information message. Uh, we were already using that, uh, that namespace. Uh, it's got a variable for active terminal, active 
text editor. That sounds like it could be something we need. Let's read more about that. Oops. Uh, Active text editor is a variable. It's a property inside of the window namespace. Keep clicking it. Probably too many times. There we go. Um, it tells me this is a text editor object. So it's an object, it's property named active text editor, and its type is text editor. I'm, I'm going to be saying the words text editor a lot in the next uh, little bit here. It's the currently active editor or it's undefined if there is no active text editor. Um, the active editor is the one that currently has focus and when none has focus, it's the one that's input has changed most recently. So if I look at just my VS code here, I've got tabs here for like I've got extension.ts open in a tab. I've got package.json open in a tab. These are text editors. And the one that I'm on, the one that I've just like typing in clicked on is my active text editor. So if I find somewhere to write here, I can like if I just start writing with the IntelliSense VS code dot window dot and then I get my IntelliSense here active text editor. If I hover over this, I get pretty much the same information as I got before. Um, is it control, yeah. Um, active text editor, it's a text editor object and it's the currently active editor. We already went over all of that, but this is how you can kind of explore using uh, IntelliSense versus uh, using the docs. So you can, you'll be going back and forth a lot. Uh, so what I want to edit the document, which is not going to be a property. It's going to be the actual, it'll be an event that I can take place. So I need to learn how to interact with text editor objects. So I'm going to open that in a new tab. I'd love to know why I keep losing that. So I know that I have a text editor property and that the it's a text editor type of object. And so my internet will totally play nice and load this page in record time. Oh, it always takes longer when you're waiting for it. Okay, great. Uh, a text editor is attached to a document, great. Uh, the text editor itself has all these properties. So when I like hit dot here, document edit oh maybe edit's going to be something i want to do uh, but it has all these properties that can be explained it has all these methods that i can call on the text editor that i'm referring to uh, and edit is going to be the one that we want to spend a little time looking at right now because i want to uh, change the content of the active text editor i want to insert text in there and again it almost looks like I know exactly where I'm going, right? Like it almost looks like I'm familiar with these docs. The first time you go through this, you're gonna spend a whole lot more time reading them and you're gonna spend a whole lot more time experimenting and understanding what this syntax means and how it's explained down here and really understanding these descriptions. Uh, but in the spirit of not beating you to death with areas that you might not, um, need to spend a lot of time interacting with and then delete that. So I got my fact, let's uh, revisit what we did here. And then what I did before was I wrote it to the console. What I want to do is insert it into my uh, active text editor. So I was gonna go vs code.window.active text editor and then dot edit and it's changed on me here it put a question mark in why did it put a question mark in well because uh, and this isn't something I don't think this exists in PowerShell if it does it was just in seven um, active text editor might be undefined and so what the syntax says is uh, if the active text editor is defined, I want to call edit on it. But if it's not defined, then I don't want to do anything here. It's going to return null. Again, more TypeScript stuff. I didn't explain it very well, uh, but VS Code did it for me. I didn't. Uh, I didn't quickly go and change that.
So I want to edit. How do I edit? IntelliSense will tell me. I just hit an opening round bracket. And it tells me this callback, edit builder as of a type VS code that extension. I'm just gonna start typing this and you'll kind of see how it works. Normally, I would go back to these docs and read this very clearly. And I might even see if I can find an, an, find an example of how it's used um, on GitHub or something like that. But there's information here on how text editor edits work. For instance, I can open that in a new tab. Very quickly. Anyway, let's do this through the IntelliSense because that seems to be faster. This is telling me the first thing I need to pass it is a callback object. So a callback is um, a parameter that it's going to reach, uh, or sorry, is an object that the next thing <laughs> that comes up next is going to reach back to and work with inside the function. It's like a lambda expression uh, if you're familiar with like C sharp link statements. Uh, plenty of other languages have this. It's just not really a thing in PowerShell. But I need to provide, like as I kind of keep typing, it starts telling me what I need. I, I'm even just gonna type edit builder and then a colon, this code dot, and I'm, again, I'm just typing what it's showing me here because I'm working off this example. This code dot text editor edit and then this arrow kind of thing. And instead of void, I want it to do something. So again, you work from examples to figure out this and you work from the IntelliSense and you spend more time reading the docs and this kind of becomes more obvious here for you. Um, this edit builder is, how do I explain? So I'm calling the edit method, edit, requires me to work with an edit builder to basically create my edit that I can then apply to the active text editor. So I need, I'm basically constructing an edit object. Like what is, what is the nature of the edit that I'm creating? Well, edit builder dot IntelliSense to the rescue. Again, maybe I want to delete lines or replace, I want to insert some text. And it's gonna tell me exactly what I need. I need a VS code dot position and I need a value of a string. So the location, where am I gonna insert the thing? Well, I wanna insert it wherever the cursor is located. So uh, again, I'll go VS code dot window dot active text editor because my cursor has gotta be in the text editor somewhere dot Selection. Why selection? A position where new text should be inserted. What is my actual selection object though? The primary selection for the text editor. Uh, what this basically means is anytime I highlight text, I've made a selection. And anytime I don't have text highlighted, the position of my cursor is technically a selection. So I just wanted to go wherever the selection goes. And selection has a start property. And again, this is all described. Uh, oh, it's going to be hard to click. Uh, I'm back one tab here, looking at my text editor object. And I would learn that by like reading about the selection and reading about the extent, uh, the selection type. Uh, it has active, it has an end, it has a start position, et cetera. A lot of reading the docs. And then the value that I want to insert, that was the actual fact. Uh, that, that's the data that I want to insert, right? And uh oh, I've got red squiggles. And it's going to tell me an argument of type position or undefined is not assignable to the position. So this is complaining very verbosely that if I don't have an active text editor, then this is going to be undefined and I need it to actually be a position. I need it to be a, a position, not, 
the undefined. And so I can't have it maybe being a position, maybe being undefined. So what I'm going to do is create a variable name position. I'm going to set it equal to, have you guys seen in PowerShell 7, the brand new ternary expressions? They're very cool. It's basically a, a very, very terse if else statement. So basically saying if I have this, then I want it to be equal. I want position to be equal to this. Else, I'm going to create a new this code dot position object at what line number? Let's just go zero. What character number? Zero. So what I've got here is a position variable that's either going to be equal to the start of my selection or a brand new uh, position at zero, zero, depending on whether or not I have this variable. Again, going quickly, I know. Uh, so coming back down here to where I need to actually provide a position, I'm going to provide it there. The reason I had to do that again is because if I don't have an active text editor, then where the heck am I going to stick this fact? Right. If I don't have my cursor actually put anywhere in my content, where am I going to put it? So I'm just putting it at zero, zero, uh, and, and it can figure out what it's going to do. So let's review. I've got my VS code. I've got my Axios to do my HTTP calls. I've got my URI to, uh, this is where I'm reaching out and getting the fact. When my extension is activated, I'm logging this message to say my uh, catfax extension is activated. And then I'm going to register the catfax command. Right uh, When that command is executed, executes what's in here, first I'm going to figure out where the position is that I want to insert my cat fact. If I have a position, like if my cursor exists in a document already, then that's where I want it to go. If my cursor is not, like if I don't have any active text editors, then I'm just applying a default of zero, zero. It'll sort out where this goes probably throw a very obnoxious looking error. So I figured out where my fact is going to go. Then I need to go get my fact from that URI. I'm making an HTTP get to that URI. And when the data comes back, I want to call the output of that call. I want to refer to it as out fact. And when I get that fact back, I want to manipulate my active text editor by editing it. And then this part went quick, I know. When I'm editing my active text editor, it needs me to create this object, which is a text editor edit. I need to build the edit that I want to apply to my text editor. And so I'm going to call it edit builder. This is the name of the edit object that I'm creating. And so what is my edit object going to do? I want it to insert the data that comes back from my fact at the position I uh, declared up here. All right. Again, I know that went fat and fast, but reading the docs is going to help. Experience is going to help. So I'm going to hit F5, and we're going to cross our fingers that I didn't make any syntax errors. And we're going to come to grips with the fact that the API can be a little bit slow sometimes, especially it feels like the first time I run this after um, writing it for the first time, it takes a second to go get the first fact, but control shift P is still called hello world. I forgot to change that. It's going to activate my extension. It's going to do that very quickly. And then if we're patient, it's got to go activate that Axios stuff. It's got to go reach out to that API. It's got to go get that fact. And it's going to definitely exercise our patience. There we go. Female cats are polyesterous. I'm sure that means something. I'm going to go move my cursor down to line three. I'm going to make a whole bunch of new lines and move it back to line four. I'm going to run this again. 
And now I get another fact. I'm even going to, we got to read these. Like, purring does not always indicate that a cat is happy. It doesn't. Cats will also purr loudly when they're distressed or in pain. Well, that's interesting. Like, hey, it's a good thing you know that. Let's do one more just for fun. In contrast to dogs, cats have not undergone major changes during their domestication process. Yeah, that's about right. Ancient cats are about the same as <laughs> today's house cats. But there we go. This is working. That's exciting. I can insert cat facts into my document all the time. Great, right? Okay. So what do I want to do now? I want to share this with the world, right? Like this is really valuable stuff. Like this is something that needs to be just like distributed everywhere. So I'm going to say I'm done writing the actual body of my uh, extension. Uh, and I need to go back here and change my package a little bit. Instead of hello world, I'm going to say this is insert cat fact. And I need to do a couple other things really quickly to be a good citizen in the Visual Studio Code marketplace. The first thing is I need to change this README, uh, which is, again, this was a default document provided by the Yeoman scaffolding. And it explains, this is the README for your extension after a brief description, complete the following sections. Well, I got bad news. We're not going to do a lot of that. Because uh, you're not going to want to see me just type this all up. Welcome to uh, let's thank you for features. It Inserts cat fact wherever our cursor is. And that's about it for the readme. Change log. Well, again, should probably do some work here and make sure that we're going to keep our change log up to date, which looks good to me. Uh, this is actually 0 0.0.1. 0 .1. And what else do we need to do here? Not done in the package.json yet, uh, but I'll show you why here. So if we go back to our terminal, and you'll recall vsce package was the command that I want to run when it's time to bundle this up and uh, ship it off to the public. I'm not running that npm run compile because um, that already occurred when I hit F5. Uh, to debug it. As you can tell me, oh no, I'm missing the publisher name. Learn more at the making extensions uh, URL here. Uh, when you go to marketplace.visualstudio.com, this is where the marketplace is. Looks familiar, marketplace.visualstudio.com. Uh, and I'm signed in so I can publish an extension. You have to register a publisher. And when you do that, you need to provide your name, an ID, you can provide an about you and a logo and all this other cool information. I've already done that. So I'm just gonna go back. And it tells me like, here's my publishing ID. Here's my publisher name itself. Here's extensions that I've already uh, deployed. This random name generator I showed you earlier is the one that just inserts random words concatenated. This is one that I was uh, messing around with for my team that uh, we ended up not using. You can make them private or public. But I need my ID here because missing publisher name. I need to fix that. I need to come back up here and look at, let's go. Back to my references. If I look at the extension manifest, this is the entire package.json documentation. Name of the extension, version of the extension, who the publisher is, okay, uh, I need to provide that. And it tells me all these things that I can put in here like categories and keywords. Uh, where's the one I'm looking for? Icon. Ooh. 
We need to provide an icon for this, don't we? And spoiler alert. I actually have an image all ready to go. That's, that was convenient, wasn't it? I'm just going to copy this, put it into my catfax directory. There's my icon, catfax.png. And now I can add, it doesn't matter where I add this, so I'm just going to put it near the top so it's easy for me to keep track of. I need publisher. That's my publisher ID. And I need, I definitely need icon. Uh, and this is the path to the icon, catfax.png. And I think I actually don't even need that. Uh, this is a, a false positive for this error that it finds. And now if I go and execute my package command again, it will execute the pre-published script, which is building this thing. It uh, compiles and then does a whole bunch of things. Uh, repository field is missing. That's fine for now, because I haven't actually set up that Git repository yet. And now, if I look back among my files, I've got catfax.0.0.1.vsix. .0 .0 and that is the uh, actual file. It goes into the Visual Studio Code Marketplace, which I will take. And I will put onto my local computer here. Manage extensions. I go new extension. It's a Visual Studio Code extension. I'm going to upload a file from my desktop, which is that. Uh, v6 that got created uh, by the uh, v, v, VSCE command. Upload that. And now it'll take a little while to verify because it's doing some checks to make sure that I didn't do anything malicious and um, like hurt Visual Studio Code or try to steal your information or access your logon tokens or break out of Visual Studio Code or something. And so this can take a little bit of time to run. But once it's done running, uh, this CatFax extension is going to be available in the Visual Studio Code Marketplace for you all to download and enjoy uh, in the insertion of CatFax into your document, which is pretty cool. We'll come back to that in a second here. Because that's the beginning to end process of making a Visual Studio Code extension. As you can tell, the documentation plays a huge part in this. You're going to be going back and forth between that a lot. The debugging process is um, is critical as well because it's a lot of trial and error. But that's it. That's the process from going from the scaffolding, editing your uh, package manifest, editing the extension.ts, or adding additional extension.ts um, type of files, um, and working with the VS Code API, working with external modules and libraries, and just generally the iterative process of creating a VS Code extension. So we'll check back on that uh, extension that I uploaded to the marketplace later, uh, if we've got time. But otherwise, that's the entire presentation on creating your first VS Code extension. I hope you feel empowered to go try this. I hope you feel like uh, this is something that you'd feel comfortable experimenting with. TypeScript is a new language, maybe you're used to PowerShell with semicolons on the end of lines, Lambda expressions, that's all weird. You'll get your head around it quicker than you think. The concepts like looping, branching, object-oriented programming in general are all applicable here. It's still just, uh, it's just writing it in a different language. It's writing it with different syntax. I'm a person who still occasionally looks up the syntax for things like uh, calculated com um, properties in select object and things like that. Um, or the syntax for creating a new array list or something in PowerShell. Like people look up syntax all the time for languages that, that they, uh, languages that they are experienced with. When you're picking up a new object-oriented language like 
going to TypeScript for the first time. It's just going to involve a little bit more looking up uh, syntax than it would in a language that you're familiar with. When you're working with a new module in PowerShell, like the first time you picked up Pester or something like that, you probably spent a lot of time reading the documentation for Pester. The same is true of the first time you use the VS Code module to write a VS Code extension in TypeScript. You're going to spend a lot of time reading those uh, documents and, and things as well. And so uh, I hope you feel empowered and I hope you do decide to take a, take a shot at this, whether it's to make a theme or it's to make a command or it's to add a UI element or something of that nature, because you can definitely do this. It is not above your pay grade. You are a dev who has the capabilities and all the skills you need to learn how to do this. So thanks once again. Uh, I'm super excited to hear from Justin next. And I want to do a special thanks to the organizers for inviting me to come talk to you uh, and to give this session in particular. Um, I really, uh, really enjoy this one. And uh, I hope you did too. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Do you still have some time for some questions? Because we do have some questions uh, in the chat right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. And yeah. I have some questions myself as well. So, Also, uh, looks like uh, the cat first box. one is from Jeff. He asked if the marketplace also has an API so you can integrate it into Azure DevOps or any kind of CI CD pipeline. Yeah, I think it does. Um, I believe you can. Uh, oh, this was just for the new version. I think you can do it with the VSCE um, executable. Um, yep. To be honest, I haven't set up a CI CD pipeline for uh, any of the extensions that I share here. Uh, when, I, when I'm creating an extension that is shared internally for my team or something uh, or for others, I'm just creating the uh, VSIX uh, file and then sideloading it. Uh, and so uh, I don't have experience with the API, uh, but I'm certain that you can do it uh, automatically. Also, my logo is here. Capfax is here. My readme is here. Changelog is here. I can install the extension into VS Code from here. Good times. Very cool. Um, are there any extensions you're currently uh, currently working on or thinking of working on or just excited uh, about? Thinking of working on for sure. There's a lot of those. Um, but I, I don't have anything in active development that's, uh, that's worth shouting out. Uh, cool. And then a last one. Uh, what would you have liked to know before you started developing your first extension? Uh, good question. I would have uh, spent a lot more time reading the docs than uh, screwing with it. <laughs> you know, uh, I thought that I could learn a lot of it just by tinkering and by using the IntelliSense and, and getting those hints. Um, but that's difficult. And so, uh, like the content that you see, like if we go back here and look at... Um, like when I hover over Active Text Editor and it shows you the description, uh, and when you hit a dot, uh, like when I hit like VS Code dot, and it shows you all the different uh, methods and properties you can call. I thought I could figure it all out just with that, uh, but it turns out uh, the documentation that's provided on the references guide is really helpful and um, provides a lot more description. Uh, in some cases, and it's organized in a way that's a lot easier to navigate and explore than just IntelliSense. Um, so I, I think, I hope I did a pretty good job of uh, showing you sort of going back and forth between the two, how what you see in the reference guides is uh, a representation of what you see in the editor and with IntelliSense, uh, because it's, it's critical that you take advantage of the... Um, of the docs, they're they're there for a reason. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much.